Hello, shalom. Welcome back to Scripture Central for our Come Follow Me on the Book of Revelation. I'm Lynn Hilton Wilson, and I love this book. I feel like of years and years and years of study, and it is one that I think testifies of our Savior like no other book. And it also lets us know what's happening in the near future and how we can better prepare for it. Today, our group of scriptures are starting with chapter 6 and going to chapter 15. We are so fortunate to study the book of Revelation hand in hand with section 77. The Lord inspired so many things that were confusing to Joseph to better understand, and it just opens up the book. It was a sealed book to most people understanding it. You know, it's not talking about Nero. It's not talking, it's talking about, and then of course we we learn the throne of God. And I'm also convinced that by understanding the plan of salvation and the temple and with the spirit of revelation, if we lived then, I think we could have understood it better, but we are so fortunate to live now and to have the ability to look at it with the blessings of the plan of salvation. The chapters we're looking at today have only 11 verses from the time period of Adam clear up to 1000 AD, or the common era. Just 11 short verses. And then we get only 14 verses from the time of 1000 to 2000, or approximately, give or take some time. So very short verses there. The majority of it from chapter 8, and this actually goes clear through the end of chapter 19, is all on the calamities after opening the seventh seal. So that's our day and age, according to Joseph Smith's interpretation. 201 verses are all about the few years that are happening right now. I mentioned um, last week that the organization is basically chronological, but there's some intermissions, some some flashbacks. He starts talking about something and he says, oh, I, I need to explain to you who the devil is. And then he goes back and gives some little intermission. So chapter six, we begin opening up the seals of this scroll that we were introduced to in chapter five, that Christ is able to take. He, as the great judge, has the right and authority, and he is worthy to open each scroll. So we'll unfold that history. He has four horses from the time of Adam to the time of the Lord's birth. And those four horses are very symbolic to symbolize the history of that world. And then in chapter seven, we have this interlude where he talks about the purified, exalted state. uh, And he uses the number 144,000. In chapter eight and nine, we'll talk about the opening of the seventh seal. We've got seven angels and seven servants. And we start with our woes. Our first woe comes there in chapter nine. Chapter 10 is an interlude or an explanation about John's call and um, the seven thunders. Then in chapter 11, they're still just opening up this seventh seal, and the Lord tells him to measure the temple. We have some interesting symbols with the Old Testament. We talk about our two witnesses in Jerusalem that are going to stand in the temple to testify for three and a half years before they're destroyed. We're also told that before these two witnesses, there's going to be a restoration. The Jews will return to their homeland and that Jerusalem will be rebuilt. Chapter 11 also talks about the second woe and the heavenly temple. Then chapters 12 to 14 briefly talk about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And we'll be introduced to a wonderful woman who represents the church. She's clothed in the sun, her feet are on the moon, and she represents the people of God. In opposition to the goodness, we also have a wicked person introduced, the dragon, the beast. He's a counterfeit lamb and power. He represents all the political, philosophical, and economical seduction of Satan. And then we'll end this week, at least, with another interlude in chapter 15, where the song of Moses and the lamb is sung. And it's just just beautiful. Then next week, we'll finish up. The opening of the seventh seal will be complete and all the way through the millennium and the great celestialized earth. Chapter 6, verse 1 begins, I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. And one of the four beasts, these are these living creatures that are around the throne of God, so they're good. It's hard in King James because the beasts are the good and the bad, so I, I really prefer other translations on this book. But the angel says, come and see. Now, this is so significant to me. Do you remember back in the Gospel of John? Before John is a disciple of Jesus of Nazareth, he is a disciple of John the Baptist. And he listens to John. He's there at the baptism. He hears John announce that Jesus of Nazareth is the Savior or the Messiah who is to come. And so Andrew and John, the two fishing partners, um, 
are down there at the River Jordan and they follow the Lord. And they say, Master, where dwellest thou? And the Lord says, come and see. And now here in this vision, one of the great living creatures around the throne of God is talking and says, come and see. Now, in section 77, we're told that Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, the seven seals, what do they mean? The Lord taught Joseph, we are to understand that the first seal contains the things of the first thousand years. Now, I mentioned this last week, but the reason why I'm mentioning it again is this is so helpful in understanding the book. I can't tell you how many biblical scholars have grappled with this for centuries without coming to this simple explanation that is the chronology of the history of the earth. And so with that understanding, I've got another chart here that shows the time periods that we're talking about. 4,000 BC is Adam, 3,000 is Noah, 2,000 is Abraham, 1,000 is King David. And then, of course, our Savior is born around the time that we refer to as zero. And then about 1,000 AD, we've got reformers. and, And during that period of time, the restoration comes. And then in 2000, we have our prophets, President Hinckley and Monson and President Russell M. Nelson so far, with more to come, I'm sure. So as we look at the six seals in light of this very helpful information from the Lord to Joseph Smith, we see continuity between the entire first 12 chapters of the book. And we can flow and we can understand who they're talking about. Verse one says, I watched the lamb open the first of the seven seals. And then we're introduced to the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Remember in Rome, a horse is a war animal. You know, this is their tank. It's not a domesticated animal. We're not talking about something that would help on a farm. This is a symbol of war and the hosts of heaven are coming. So in verse one, he said, come and see. And then in verse two, he says, there before me was a white horse and its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode as a conqueror bent on conquering. Now, this is significant in the Roman world because a conquering general was allowed to ride on a white horse or have a white pair of horses pull his chariot. So the crown would be given if he conquered and the white horse is significant. So this first thousand years from Adam to Noah is represented by a conquering horse. Can you think of anything in that period of a thousand year history that would have represented from God's perspective, a conqueror? I think this is Enoch. This is, this is Enoch, 365 years of preaching the gospel and the people were able to create a Zion society. They lived with one heart and one mind and there was no poor among them. They were unified in Christ. They had the gifts of charity and faith and hope and they spent their energy on what was most important. So this is a exciting thing to look at, this first seal of the conqueror being either Adam or Enoch or one of the great and noble ones in that period of time. The second seal is opened next from approximately 3000 to 2000 BC. Revelation chapter six, verse four reads that the second horse was red and had power to him that was given unto Sat to take peace from the earth and that they would kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. This is a period of destruction. This is terrible. Well, remember the city of Enoch was all the righteous. So all the righteous had been left and the only people that were left were the wicked. And the third seal is described sort of like starvation. And they talk about this black horse. And one of the examples is given in verse five as saying, there are two pounds of wheat for a day's wages and six pounds of barley for a day's wages. So your entire day is spent on just the food for your family. You're barely surviving because of the famines and the starvation, the difficulty time, and the history of the world. Um, Everywhere we read is smitten with famines and starvation during this period of time. The fourth seal from a thousand years before the Lord's birth is described as a pale rider on sort of a green or a death-colored horse. Chapter six, verse seven reads, they were given power over a quarter of the earth to kill with a sword, with famine, with pestilence. These four horsemen then end. We don't have any more horse riders. They're all the thousand years prior to John's life. And then we have the fifth seal, which comes at the time of the Lord's resurrection when John is living. And it says, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony that they had upheld. 
And then skipping down a little bit, John cries out, how long? You know, these are his people. These are his saints that are being martyred for their beliefs. And it's just killing him. And so he pleads with the Lord. You know, I thought uh, this wasn't going to be this long. When are you coming back? But the Lord promises him in chapter 6, verse 11, that those white robes were given to every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season. Now, the word rest is interesting when we take it in the scriptural context. We're told in the Doctrine and Covenants that the rest of the Lord is entering into his presence. So these saints have entered into the Lord's presence and he will give them rest. Don't warn that they're taken from this earth. They are arriving in the arms of their Savior. The sixth seal is representative of approximately 1000 AD to 2000. And it says that there was a great earthquake and the sun turned black with sackcloth. This is chapter 6, verses 12 to 17. And the moon was like blood and the stars fell to the earth. You know, we have had so much pollution and disasters and natural calamities that have caused the sun to be darkened and the moon to be red with blood. This This is an image that we can all relate to, can't we? Chapter 6, verse 14 says that the heavens departed as a scroll when it was rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of its place. Now, this is sort of an interesting image because uh, there has been a little bit of volcanic changing, and islands are moving an inch or two, but it doesn't quite fit. If the heavens are like a scroll and it's opened, when the scroll is opened, you can read it. You can learn what's happening. So that might be a symbolic way of interpreting this. I am not sure, but the idea that every mountain and hill is moved also relates back to what our Savior taught us when he was on the earth, that even the rocks would cry out if they could not testify of the Lord, and that the great darkness at the Savior's death, you know, the earth mourns with the Lord and lives with him too. Chapter 6, verse 15 and 16 continue on. Then the kings of the earth, the rich, the mighty, It goes on, the slave, the free, they're all hiding in caves. They're among the rocks of the mountains and they call out, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. You know, the destruction, the calamities of these last days are so horrific that everyone is just begging to be hidden from God. Chapter seven continues on. I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, restraining the winds. And remember the word wind in Greek is the same as the spirit. And we saw that in Nicodemus, John chapter 4, where he uses the word play on wind and spirit. And now John is using the same word play here, that these angels are holding back the wind and the spirit. And we continue on to read what Joseph asked about this. What are we to understand about these four angels spoken of in chapter 7, verse 1? And the Lord answered that they're the angels sent forth from God to whom is given power over the four parts of the earth. So the whole earth is often described as the number four. I don't think too many people really thought it was flat at this time. Maybe later in the dark ages, but not, not, not now. But the four parts of the earth to save life and to destroy. These are they who have the everlasting gospel to commit to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, having power to shut up the heavens and to seal it up unto life or to cast down in the regions of darkness. So the sealing power is returning. God's power is coming down to earth. Just to remind you, we have all this angelic intervention on the earth. Do you remember back in the Doctrine and Covenants in section 130, the Lord taught Joseph that all the angels who minister to this earth have a lifetime on this earth. They've either already been born or they will be born. But if we read about an angel, they belong here. They're they're us. They're part of us. Revelation chapter 7 through 9, just in review, talks about these four points, that the angels are coming to destroy life, they're coming to preside over the missionary work, they are coming to shut up the heavens, and they are coming to seal the saints to eternal life, or to seal some to damnation. So that is a brief overview at these two chapters in, from 7 to 9. But now slowly going through it, in chapter 7, verse 2, it says, I saw another angel ascending from the east, holding the seal of the living God. And he shouted with a loud voice to the four angels. So Joseph says, well, who's the angel from the east? This is section 77, verse 9. The Lord tells him, he is whom is given the seal of the living God. 
over the twelve tribes of Israel. Wherefore he crieth to the four angels, having the everlasting gospel. This is Elias, which was to come to gather together the tribes of Israel and restore all things. Now, the name Elias is almost as common as the name Mary. You know, it's, it's tricky. We've got Elias as a title of one who's coming to prepare the way. So in that context, John the Baptist was an Elias. But in the Greek language, Elias is also the name for Elijah. So it's a little bit confusing. But in this situation, this angel from the east is a messenger of the Lord who's going to come and gather together the 12 tribes of Israel. Revelation chapter 3 continues on, do not harm the land until we seal the servants of our God on their foreheads. This is a sacred message. And he talks about sealing later on, sealing up, sealed to. This is a powerful word that's not as much of our vocabulary as it was in the ancient world, but with the sealings on the scrolls and now the idea of making something permanent, of making sure something can be only be read by a judge. You know, it all ties in with the same things that we read about earlier. Verse 4 continues on, I heard the number of those who were sealed was 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. As we talked about the numerology earlier, 144,000 is 12 squared, and 1,000 is the largest number, and so anytime you add it to something, it, it makes it more complete and whole or perfected, and anytime you square a number, it's perfected. So you have God's order the 12 parts of the creation, the 12 moons in the year, and then the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 apostles of the Lamb, God's order is now perfected. So those who are sealed are part of God's order. Do I believe it specifically means an exact number? I don't know. I'll put that on the back burner. I doubt it. I think it is symbolic of those who come unto Christ. But when Joseph asked the Lord about this in section 77, verse 11, he said, those who are sealed are high priests, ordained unto the holy order of God. That's another name for the Melchizedek priesthood. To administer the everlasting gospel, for they are they who are ordained out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people by the angels to whom is given power over the nations of the earth to bring as many as will come to the church of the firstborn. So these are people who are working to gather Israel. They have been endowed in the temple. They are high priests. They have the holy order of God. Um, I don't think, though, that it necessarily means that they are only men, because we are taught that um, there are priestesses who serve in the temple that we'll find out in the next life, I'm sure. Another reason why I think that perhaps it's also priestesses included in that is because of thinking that Paul taught. Do you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 11, he said, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. In the Lord's kingdom, in our heavenly temples, you have to have companionship, and the two are integral, and, and one is not without the other. And if they have to be together to be joint heirs, I, I assume that that refers to both. The prophet Joseph also spoke on this in a sermon in Nauvoo. He said, It is not only necessary that you should be baptized for your dead, but you will have to go through all the ordinances for them, the same as you have gone through to save yourselves. And there will be 144,000 saviors on Mount Zion, and with them an innumerable host. That's why I said, I don't think it's a limiting number. There's going to be an innumerable host that no man can number. Oh, I beseech you to go forward and make your calling and election sure. You know, Joseph taught this. Peter taught it in his epistles. This is our highest ordinances that are given to those who um, have qualified and lived worthy of their temple covenants. Most of us will receive this ordinance in the next life, but some do receive it in this life. Chapter 7, verse 9. A great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne. And then continuing on, he describes in verse 13, one of the elders asked me, these in the white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? And, you know, John says, I don't know, you tell me. And he answers in verse 14, these are they who have come out of great tribulation. 
They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's the NIV translation. And I am so grateful that during our times of struggle, our times of trial, our times of great tribulation, we can fall on our knees and be strengthened by the Lord. And that falling on our knees is part of the process of purification, of sanctification, of becoming holy. You know, I, I, we are not people who believe you should seek trials, that you should go out and seek tribulations. And, and we don't go around flogging ourselves and cutting ourselves. But we believe strongly that when we are physically and emotionally weak, God can strengthen us. Our weaknesses can become strengths through the miraculous healing and intervention of our Savior. And I can testify that I believe in a God of miracles, and I have seen this happen in my life. Chapter 17 has some beautiful imagery. I just love the um, symbols here. And I'll read it from the NIV. The lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to the springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eye. This is going to be a happy day. But until then, chapter 8 says the seal is still being opened, the seventh seal. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in the heaven for about a half an hour. Now I've heard lots of people's speculations, both in the church and out of the church. And I would encourage you not to speculate. Spend your time on building the kingdom instead of worthless speculations on what this half hour of silence is. And I have heard a whole bunch of them and none of them make any sense to me. I think God has a much broader view on this and I'm waiting to get light knowledge from him. Um, We do not know what that half hour meant. No matter how many clever people think they figured it out, I think we can patiently wait and, and move ahead. But there is some period of silence after the opening of the seventh seal. We are introduced to seven angels now, and these seven angels are bringing the seven horrific plagues. Many of those plagues line up with the plagues that Moses used against the Egyptians. So much of the Old Testament is paralleled at the end of times, just as we see in the Book of Mormon as well. In chapter 8, verse 7, the first plague is hail and blood and fire. The next plague, chapter 8, verse 9 to 10, The sea becomes filled with fire and parts of the sea life are all killed. And then chapter 8, verse 10 to 11 and verse 3, there's this fiery star and the bitter water. The next plague, number 4, is still in chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. That's when the sun and the moon and the stars are darkened. The fifth plague is now in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And they talk about the bottomless pit is opened and Satan's temptations. You know, they go into great detail on some of these. They're just horrific. Chapter 9, verses 12 to 19 is the sixth plague, and it's talking about the smoke that's going to kill and the brimstone and the fire that's going to come. And then the last plague, this lightning and thunder and the greatest earthquake that we know, it starts in chapter 11, but then it continues on in chapter 16, because remember, we have some flashbacks. So we'll talk about the rest of this seventh plague next week in our Come, Follow Me. I'm fascinated that Moses' plagues included the hail, fire, the water turning to blood, the bitter water, the wormwood, the sun being darkened, and the bottomless pit of death. You know, all of these were familiar images to the Israelites, and they should have recognized them as this is happening to the wicked. But do you remember when Moses sends these plagues out that they do not all affect the children of Israel? Those that were living in Goshen and living close to their God were removed from those, especially on the 10th plague. Do you remember when the blood of the lamb for the Passover was to be painted on the doorpost and the lintel so that the destroying angel would pass by? That is what the book of Revelation describes. This is how John describes it's going to happen to the saints in the last days, that they can be removed from some of these disasters, but not all of them. It says in chapter 9, verse 1, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, And to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Well, it's a good thing we've got section 77 there. And in verse 12, we're described, this is Satan. Continuing on in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4, it says, Do not hurt those men, and I assume that this means those brethren, those men and women who are saints of God, which have the seal of God on their forehead. 
But remember, the Holy Spirit of promise is given to us in our ordinances to confirm that they're done with proper authority and that our heart is in the right place. But just because we've been baptized, we've checked that box, does not mean that we have our ordinances and our confirmation from God intact. The Holy Spirit of promise will not allow hypocrisy. There's no guile that will be allowed into heaven. So if we want to be reserved from some of these tragedies of the last day, we have to honor our covenants. And remember, our prophet said the time is running out. We need to do it now. Moving ahead now to chapter 10, John now leaves the history of the world and says, I've got to talk to you about my mission call. So we get one of these intermissions, one of these flashbacks. Verse 10 of chapter 10, I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. So John is commanded to partake of this scroll, but it has a very interesting effect. And I just think sometimes that's how it is for us. We're eager to go and serve, but it gets hard and we do not want to stay there and it feels miserable. Well, the message of John the Beloved is you keep serving. If you agreed to take that mission, you continue to serve. The Lord gives us some explanation on that in section 77, verse 14. What are we to understand by the little book which was eaten by John? And the Lord tells him it was a mission, an ordinance. Isn't that interesting? The ordinance for him to gather the tribes of Israel. Behold, this is Elias, who it is written must come and restore all things. This is fascinating to me because many times we call Elias other people. But right here, we are told John the Baptist is one of those Eliases. And his role in the latter days, since he is staying on the earth from the time of the Lord's death all the way through until the Lord's second coming, is to gather Israel. This is just fascinating to me. He is the one who is orchestrating all this. So when the prophets recently said, our most important work is to gather Israel, I feel like we are serving with John. We are doing God's work and we are part of this great closing up of the seven seals before the millennium. We go back now to the history chronologically after the flashback to chapter 11. And chapter 11 describes these two witnesses. I'd like to read from this section 77 of the Doctrine and Covenants in verse 15. They are two prophets that are to be raised up to the Jewish nation in the last days and at the time of the restoration and to prophesy to the Jews after they are gathered and have built their city of Jerusalem in the land of their forefathers. We have some fascinating information on these two witnesses. You know, they're going to seal the heavens. You know, in, in the book of Revelation, they're described as two trees, these two strong people. But in the book of Revelation, John himself gives a definition of what a prophet is. This is in chapter 19, verse 10, I think. He said, a prophet is one who has a testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, other people have assumed, oh, these are going to be members of the 12. Well, maybe, but that is not John's definition of the word. So if they are, wonderful, we'll recognize them, we'll know when those three and a half years start. But if they are not, if they are people who have a testimony that Jesus of Nazareth was the promised Messiah and the Savior of the world, it'll be a little bit harder um, to identify them. But soon or later, the whole world knows about them because they're so obnoxious in what they're doing. And they are, and they are directing horrific warfare. And they are, are very powerful people. And we read about them not only here in the book of Revelation, but elsewhere in the scriptures as well. Chapter 12 now describes this beautiful woman who represents the church. There appeared a great sign in heaven in the likeness of things on the earth, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. So he says, I'm going to try to describe it to things you know. And on her head was a crown of 12 stars. Being with child, she cried, travailing in birth. So she is going through the labor pains. She's the church and she's trying to deliver something and she's crying out in pain. And then we're introduced in chapter 12, verse 4, to her adversary. And it's a dragon. The dragon's tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I assume that it might refer to the third of the hosts of heaven that were followed um, Lucifer and, and did not choose to come to earth and receive their bodies. And it, a third in the ancient world does not mean 33%, you know, 0.33333. It's a, it's a portion 
But continuing on in verse 4, it says that the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So the church is trying to gather Israel, trying to build the kingdom of God, and Satan is right there working on it. Verse 7 continues on in chapter 12. So here's one of his flashbacks. He says, oh, I've I've got to introduce who the devil is. Okay, so let's go back to the pre-mortal life before all this happened. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. Well, we're taught in the restoration that Michael was Adam. And pre-mortally, Adam fought against Lucifer and gathered the righteous to follow our Savior. This is added on in restored scripture, but this is a powerful message here. But no one else understands it like we do because they don't have the keys that we've been given in the restoration. In these next few chapters, 12, 13, we are introduced to three satanic beasts. I want to make sure that you know who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. It's referred to sometimes in scholarship as a satanic trinity. They're in opposition to the Godhead. They're counterfeits. There's the red dragon, who's the devil. There's the sea beast, who represents the great and abominable church in chapter 13, verse 1. And then there's a land beast, and he's got all these horns. He's the Antichrist, so don't get him mixed up, because horns can be power or horns can be wickedness. But all of these three wicked beasts have power. That's part of the problem. Chapter 13 describes those who follow these three beasts also. And I'll read a little bit here in chapter 13, verse 12. It says that there are people who receive power from the devil. And then in chapter 13, verses 13 to 14, they are deceived by the wonders. And then in verse 16, the beast will mark his followers. These wicked followers are going to have a a marking on them. And in verse 17, he commences to govern by him. The wicked are being governed by this beast who have the mark. Now, Joseph spoke a little bit on this too. He says, there are those who are marked with the beast, and there are those who are marked with the seal of God. The Father's name is written on their foreheads. And he spoke on this again on August 13th, 1843, where it says that they shall seal the servants of God in their foreheads, etc. It means to seal the blessings on their heads, meaning the everlasting covenant, thereby making their calling and election sure. Now, Joseph is often referred to as the permanent sealing of the Holy Spirit of promise that we read about in sections 132 and 76 and 124. But there is also a period of time where we are sealed if we live the law and the conditional time of the Spirit can teach us and help us become more Christ-like. In chapter 14, we see a change of scene. And I think you'll recognize verse six and seven. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. This we believe as a representation of angel Moroni, of Peter, James, and John, of John the Baptist, you know, of all the angels, the many, many angels that have come back to the earth to minister. And we believe there are now many, many ministering of angels in our temples, in our homes, in our churches. As we go through our life, as we're striving to live connected to the Lord, I believe there are ministration of angels around us. I have felt them in my life. But he says that the harvest of the earth is ripe. And that phrase is also used many times in the early sections of the Doctrine and Covenants. The field is white already for harvest. The gathering of Israel has commenced. We're in that half hour of silence and when the seventh seal is opened and the Lord is telling John that there is going to be a great gathering of Israel. In chapter 15, we are introduced to seven more angels who now bring the seven plagues. These are the worst destruction that have been discussed yet in the history of the world. They are horrific. And from chapters 15, verse 1 to 8, they talk about them. It's sort of interesting to see in the midst of these seven plagues coming down to the earth that the earth is described as a sea of glass. This is in chapter 15, verse 2. As you recall, back in the vision of the throne of God in chapter 4, it was described the same way, and it will be described that way again when we get to the end, when the earth is in its paradisiacal glory. But this is interesting that even at this time, there is a clarity. You can see God in heaven. The angels can see the earth differently, perhaps is one way of interpreting it. Verse 5 and 6 reads in the NIV, 
I looked and I saw the heavens, the temple, that is the tabernacle of the covenant law. And it was opened and out of the temple came seven angels with seven plagues. And they were dressed in clean, shining linen. And they wore golden sashes around their chest. These beautiful angels have a role to play. And even though it is a horrific role, I want you to remember that everything God does, his entire plan is all for our good. It's all for our growth. His glory is our immortality and eternal life. And sometimes I think it's necessary to remove us from the wickedness and the blindness and the poison that we're living in in our society to another place where we can repent and learn in a different environment. So even though they're horrific times of death and destruction, it is still a merciful God who is removing his children from a place of danger where the adversary is so powerful and allowing them to learn again in heaven. Verse 7 says that one of the four beasts or these living creatures around the throne of God gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God. And then it says that he sees the heavenly temple again. This is chapter 15, verse 8. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. Well, I hope that rings a bell for you for the incense altars, because the smoke coming from the incense was to go day and night as the prayers of our Lord. The book of Hebrews also talks about this. And next week, we'll get together to talk about 16. And chapter 16 is going to start the seven plagues and the action call from heaven that will lead up to the second coming. And then we'll get the second coming of the Lord and the millennium and the celestialized earth and the glorified state. What a blessing it is to live in a day and age where we have a prophet in the land, where we can follow the prophet and be saved from some of these calamities. But the best thing we can do to prepare for the last days is to gather Israel, to learn the language of the Lord, to come unto Christ, to build his kingdom, and to prepare a Zion society so that he might come. We can cut the calamity short, which we'll talk about next week. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.